The new film Big Eyes tells the story of painter Margaret Keene, famous for her very familiar waif paintings from the 50s and 60s, little girls with very big, expressive eyes. Amy Adams plays Keene, and Christoph Waltz plays her husband, Walter, who takes all the credit for her paintings. film is directed by Tim Burton and written by Golden Globe and Writers Guild winners Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski, and they join me here on the Venice Maze podcast. Gentlemen, hey. thanks Hello, for coming. Steve. Thank you for having us. Uh, so I saw the film last night, um, and I'll, I'll tell you that my, my recollection going in was at my grandmother's house. Uh, she had, you know, these sort of very precious, um, I, I think they were either based on Keen or they were Keen right. knockoffs. That, 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 that's very perceptive. Be because, the yeah, because uh, in the 1960s, the Keens were so successful that all these ripoff artists came along and made sort of like variations on them. But it is interesting when you actually look at the, the actual Margaret Keene paintings, there's a, they have a soulfulness that the ripoffs don't. There actually is like a quality of sadness to the eyes that the ripoffs don't. But it's funny you bring up your grandmother. That's actually how Tim Burton knows the art as well. Oh, I mean, is that right? Because Tim Burton grew up. He always, through Steve's grandmother? Yeah. Exactly. Through, through, the, no, through my He would come over to your grandmother's house. In Altoona, house and... Pennsylvania. <laughs> Somehow Tim Burton and she became close. Um, no, he he was like, this was art in our family. You know, he's like, my grandmother had it. I'd go to the doctor's office. I'd go to the dentist's office. It's like my family didn't know the difference between regular art and keen art. And so when Tim was growing up, that's that's just what he that's just what he knew. Tim also turns it into Burbank bashing. And, well, that's what people in Burbank thought was art. Uh, I, I think he's sort of speaking for America. That yeah, yes, exactly. yes. As Burbank goes, so is the nation. Yeah. So, so, Scott, how do you even come across a story like this? Where does the, I mean, obviously you've made, uh, for people that don't know, uh, People versus Larry Flint and Ed Wood, uh, kind of biopics based on people that not everybody knows. How did you come across this story? Uh well, like the others, I mean, we we tend to come across these marginal figures and sort of in the in the fringes of pop culture, and you never know whether you'll stumble across this. Uh, I, I stumbled across this story in the Encyclopedia of Bad Taste. <laughs> uh, we were we were writing a movie about uh, a very advanced planet, so science fiction comedy, many galaxies away, that ends up being destroyed by a bunch of crap from Earth, and. Uh, <laughs> And a bunch of old pop culture junk, MC Hammer albums, yeah. and Cocoa Puff cereal, and Gilligan's Island reruns, and all this stuff kind of gets to this higher society and sort of just makes them all explode because they can't, their minds can't handle it. <laughs> and flipping pages through this book, I stumble across two pages about the Keens, which just sort of just had a brief summary of their lives, and I was just flabbergasted. And I, I showed Larry. Uh, Larry, Larry knew a bit about them already because we have a friend, Matthew Sweet, who is a big time keen collector. Yeah. Who's Matthew Sweet? Matthew Sweet was, uh, is a rock star. Have you seen yeah. a couple of his songs um, for us? He had a great album called Girlfriend. It's kind of a seminal 90s power pop album. But he's, he, uh, he's, I feel he, bad. You know, I, I was at one of your Q&As nice. and I was a DJ Program director oh, wow. during right. this period, right. and I cannot figure out who Matthew. I mean, no, it was, it was no, a tough album. Yeah. Yeah. No, girlfriend's an amazing album. He's got other things too. Now he works a lot with uh, Susanna Hoss from the Bangles. Oh, sure. And they put out these kind of albums. Uh, they 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 tackle a decade at a time, like uh, songs of the '70s, songs of the '80s, songs of the '60s. Uh, but but in the early days of eBay, uh, Matthew sort of fell into this big-eyed art collection, so he would just like have a constant search for Keen, and and at that point you could get him for next to nothing. So he kind of he kind of cornered the market before there actually was a market, and so he he became an obsessive collector of not just the Keens but all the knockoffs. And so you'd go over his house, and it was like an episode of Hoarders, where literally it was <laughs> like you could barely walk through. What all. an odd yeah. uh, experience that must be. Yeah, walking. Yeah, and, 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 and he would have see them, nothing but these precious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He would have them stacked up uh, by knockoffs. Yeah. So here'd be a whole stack of Frankas. There'd be a stack of Igors. <laughs> and then the whole bathroom would just be filled with Eves. Yeah, yeah. Eves, crazy. You couldn't even get to the toilet. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really weird. But it was really nice because it gave us, uh, uh, you know, a guy we could call. A right. guy we could call and say, well, what, what about this? What about that? And and he eventually hooked us up with the Keen uh, Gallery up in San Francisco. I mean, we wound up we wound up doing a lot of work before we contacted the Keen Gallery because we wanted to make sure that it was a movie that we wanted to uh, to actually do. So we did lots and lots of research. We did we did quite a bit of research going up, you know, to the UCA Library and looking at microfiche and stuff like that. Okay, so how do you track down Margaret Keen? Um. 
Well, it's technically not hard to find her because she does have a gallery. Um, I mean, at the, at the end of the movie. So I guess phone book. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean she, she is not she's not physically at the gallery, but there there's a nice man named Robert who runs the gallery, yes. and we explained who we were and what we wanted to do, and he was a little skeptical, and so we kind of had to win him over enough so that he would call her up and say, "There's a couple gentlemen from Hollywood who want to meet you," and you know you're jumping through hoops, and and finally an agreement was made. All right, if they if they fly up, she'll have lunch with you, and so. Then we really crammed prepping for this meeting because we wanted to dazzle her. We wanted her to know that we were taking this really seriously. We weren't just waltzing in. Uh, like Larry said, we went through all the old microfiche, all the old San Francisco newspapers from the 50s and 60s, the Honolulu papers from the 70s, the old Life magazines, the Time magazines, anything we could we could get just so we would understand the basics of the story. Right. But what we really were getting was the public story because Walter was the front man. So it, right. was, it was constantly getting, you know, this Walter's side of the story. Uh, and that's where we discovered things like that Dick Nolan character that Danny Houston plays. Right. I mean, he was obviously a guy who just like anytime Walter would do something, he'd plan a story. Yeah. And yeah, so we yeah. were getting that. But we, we were what we were really lacking was the personal side from Margaret. And that's really what we, when we went to San Francisco, that's what we were ser- searching for. So Christoph Waltz plays uh, her husband who finds a way to take credit for <laughs> everything. Yeah. Um, yes. And he's not a painter, but passes him off as one. He's a, he's a fraud. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, he, when we started doing the research, I mean, he was, Clearly an unbelievable character. I mean, I mean, he's so charming. He's so funny. He's so in love with himself. He had a lot of canned speeches where he would talk about himself in the third person. And he'd refer to, you know, when people talk about Michelangelo and Gauguin and Walter Keene, he would just say stuff like that. <laughs> I mean, this is unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the tricky part was that Margaret is a very quiet character. And clearly sort of the, the themes of the movie are sort of like female empowerment and how this – mid-century woman learn to finally not let the man just speak for her at all times but he was the flashy guy and in the past all of our biopics have been about those guys right I mean, we like those guys we like guys who just want to stand on a soapbox with a bunch of microphones and talk to a crowd about themselves sure. right larger right. than life characters yeah those guys are so much fun but we we made a big choice which was we're not going to make him the lead we're going to make her the lead because we felt that she's the one with the journey, and 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 she's the one who comes out at the end different than when she started. Right. And and so the we we had to figure out how we could tell the movie from her point of view, even though he's doing most of the yapping. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it was interesting when we went up to meet Margaret, we'd ask her these kind of questions like, why did you why did you say yes the first time? How did it all develop? And we we sort of learned that backstory, and 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 it certainly changed uh, our attitude about like certain things. Like we didn't realize before that how much how important. Margaret's daughter would be to the story yeah, because yeah. she actually had to lie to her daughter, and uh, it, you know the, her daughter was all she cared about. It was all she had in her life, and and so it created this this you know this separation, and uh, and it was so emotional, and, and she's still very emotional about it because she's still very very close with her daughter. But we realized that had to be a gigantic part of the movie. She also would talk about we had to say like, well, didn't your friends know? Didn't your friends know that you were the painter? She's like, well, the thing was I you know I had friends at the beginning. But Walter, you know, either would alienate them or I, I wasn't good at lying, so I wouldn't go to that lunch with them anymore. And so they all kind of drifted away because she just, you know, uh, she just didn't feel good about herself. And so she became this completely isolated woman who all she did was paint. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, in a, in a style that nobody had ever uh, right. seen, yeah. clearly. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, but we'll continue on, on Big Eyes, but I, I'm curious about you guys. I mean, I, I followed your your career i mean i know ed wood well and i know uh the people versus larry flint and i remember meeting woody harrelson and interviewing him during that uh during that period how did you two start writing together um oh it it was very unpremeditated uh we we were roommates on and off all through college at usc film school and uh during our senior year i i stumbled across some ann lander's columns uh, which were tragic. But, but we, <laughs> but we, we've, we've sort of made a habit of sort of writing funny movies about terrible things. Yeah. And, and, and the tragic stories in Ann Landers were about a high school kid who was vandalizing a school gymnasium, and then he fell through the roof and he got paralyzed. 
and then his parents sued the school district for damages. Right, and people are outraged that oh, people wait, are like he, up he, in arms. He was he was vandalizing the school. How can he you know how can he complain that he got hurt? And 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 so we we started riffing about this. Yeah. Okay, and saying well yeah that's a terrible story, but and then, of course this goes back to who we were obsessed with in 1985. Um, yeah, but what <laughs> if what if it wasn't a th- wasn't it wasn't some kid? What if it was Morris Day from the time? Right, because because Purple Rain just came out. Because we were, we were obsessed oh, man, with Morris I Day. I know this period. But so this, exactly. no, this is like how, you know how you end up yeah. writing a script. And it's like yeah, what if it was Morris Day? Man, he's not he's not he's not breaking into a school. He's breaking into a house, and he breaks into Albert Brooks's house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he falls to Albert's roof, but Albert doesn't get along with his next door neighbor. Walter Matthau. <laughs> ah, okay, now we're talking. And so Walter Matthau, Matthau is a lawyer. So he pulls the thief aside as he's being wheeled away in the ambulance and says, hey, I think you have a case here. Right. Because you never actually got to steal anything because you got hurt before it so you broke in. Yeah. So you, you're a trespasser. You're not a thief. And here, here's my card. We got to talk. <laughs> and, and that sort of, right. us just sort of riffing on this turned into, a, can we write a whole script? And then, uh, I mean, this is back in, 80, in 85, nobody in college wrote a whole script. Yeah. Right, right. You, you, uh, you would graduate from USC Film School, which was the top film school in the country, yep. writing 40 pages. And so for us to say, can we get to a page 120 was cuckoo. But we and did you, it. You got we there? We just, did. just for fun. We, right. were, we were not trying to break into Hollywood. We were not trying to sell it. We were not trying to do anything. We just thought it was a funny idea. Right. But we wound, up, we wound up passing around to our friends. And there was some, I was a TA in a class at USC. And someone who was in that class was, in a, was like an intern at ICM. And it went up at an agent, young agent's desk. And she read it. And this, a bunch of things happened. And two weeks after we graduated from college, it sold to 20th Century Fox. And we had our own office. And we kind of been working ever since. <laughs> You know. And nothing ever came of that script. Or? No, and then then we yeah. got made. Home records. Yeah. Home records. <laughs> <laughs> never got yeah. made. Never but, got made. But it it, yeah. it established us. Right. Um, but we did make a big jump in our career because uh, because obviously when Scott was talking, it's it, we we ended our career really kind of writing comedies. Yeah, you know, we were kind of we then we wound up writing those problem child movies and and so but we really kind of felt cornered by that. Yeah, where uh, we'd go to an office and we pitch an idea and they'd be, oh my god, that's a great idea for a movie, but. You guys are the guys who write problem child movies. I don't know if you're good enough to write your own ideas, and that freaked us out. So we said, we said, let's go back and kind of do something more personal and write something for ourselves in kind of an indie kind of way. And that's when we wrote Ed Wood. Yeah, and that kind and, of changed our careers. And Ed, why was Ed Wood your choice? Why, why Ed Wood? Um, well, after Problem Child, we started identifying with Ed Wood. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, Ed Problem Wood Child got the worst reviews. Oh ever. my God! Yeah. I mean. You know, like, but they were they made they, they made a lot of money. They were very successful. Yeah. I mean, but people, the critics hated these movies. Yeah. I mean, I mean the movies are pretty terrible, yeah. but they're very funny. Uh, but Ed Ed Wood at the time was famous as the most incompetent director who ever lived. He was voted the worst director of all time by the Golden Turkey Awards, and everyone would laugh at him. And ha ha, he wears a dress, and uh, ha ha, he doesn't know how to match a day shot and a night shot, and all that. And then the tombstones fall over in the background, and that that was sort of the shtick. We started identifying with him because we didn't set out to make a terrible movie with Problem Child. It just turned into one. (laughs) And this is kind of what, I mean, what happens with most movies because it takes like a billion people to get a movie made. Yeah. And there's so many moving parts that odds are a bunch of those parts just aren't going to work. And you're going to end it with a a pile of shit. It's just just the law of averages. Yeah. And so we started talking about Ed saying, well, what if you looked at Ed Wood sympathetically and said, you're not going to make fun of him at all. You're just going to rally to his cause and say, you know what? He had a big dream and he came out here from Poughkeepsie and he made six feature movies and he made himself a director and he had a lot of friends and he gave them work. He didn't pay them very much, but he, he gave them hopes and aspirations and they all had a good time. Right. And what if we just celebrate that? Right. What if we concentrate on his passion? Right, right, and, right. Uh, and no one had ever really looked at Ed Wood that way. And, and, it, and it took the project from being a, a, a goofy movie, a movie about like someone who you're ridiculing, into something that people could really understand and, 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 uh, and feel for. It gave the movie a heart. Right. Anybody that ever had Correct. a passion, Correct. anybody yes. that ever had a dream Correct. could Correct. identify with Correct. Ed Wood. Yeah, so. Because so they, don't, they we, don't always turn out well. Right. right. Well, it's always funny whenever but I meet. like so a, root for him. Exactly. Whenever yeah. I meet uh, like, a, like a world class director, you know, at a, at a cocktail party, I'm at some point, they pull us both aside and it's like, you know, I feel like I'm just like Ed Wood, or you know, <laughs> we're all just one step away from being Ed Wood, and right. that's why one of the few scenes in the movie that's just 
totally invented is a scene where Ed Wood meets Orson Welles. Yes. Because we were driving around one day and we thought, what if, what if, what if, what if the worst director of all time and the greatest director of all time actually <laughs> met and had a drink together? What would they say? And we realized, oh, my God, they would, they would literally have the exact same problems. You know, they would talk. You know, their their movies are falling apart. They can't finish things. The producers are taking over. They got to cast the wrong actor for the lead. And so it, it was a that was a, an epiphany that that took Edward from being a specific to Edward being uh, more of a general. Now I've always been curious because you go from Edward to People versus Larry Flint. Yes, right? right. That was the next. Right. Did that whet your appetite for biopics? Yeah, it, yeah. It was sort of the it, Ed Wood was the script was received really well. Which we weren't expecting. I mean, we, 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 we had this sort of this avenue where we were able to get the script to Tim Burton. And then Tim decided to make the movie, which was fantastic. But besides that, just the script sort of getting passed around town, there was a lot of, can you believe this? And suddenly all these fancy people who didn't want to meet us after the Problem Child movies wanted to meet us after this script. And we thought this was so interesting because it was so shamelessly not commercial. Right. Yeah. But, right. It, but it, was, it was trying to be really interesting. And it had a really unusual tone. And we're just getting all these meetings and people saying, well, what are you guys going to do next? What are you going to do next? Right. And, was, and, and yeah. so, uh, I mean, we, we like to say, like, a- after after Larry Flint, basically, we were done making our dream projects because <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time ago. Right. Because uh, uh, in at, at USC, I mean, I had actually done a whole pro- proposal to make a documentary about Ed Wood. And then when Larry Flint was running for president, we were roommates. And uh, when he was running for president, then when he was doing all the stuff in the courtroom, a section in the movie where he's like, like wearing the diaper to the trial yeah, and he's right, right. throwing the oranges at the judge and he's showing up with the hookers with $10,000 in pennies and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> right. And, and Larry and I would fight over the paper every morning, like trying to grab the Larry Flint story. They were so first. funny. They were so funny. And so, I mean, he was kind of a fetish that had gone back again to when we were you know roommates. Well, it's also right. i mean both of them are kind of folk heroes in their own yeah way. weirdly enough i mean what happened what really was outsider yeah. folk yes. correct no. i mean what happened was after, you know i think what we learned of the problem child thing was that you get pigeonholed in hollywood really quickly so like we were the guys who wrote problem child so when ed wood became a success we were like uh, oh maybe we can wear this wear this thing because maybe we can get another weird biopic made through the system because right now people that's what people think of us and so and and in terms of that genre i mean i think we we kind of embraced it because we looked at the biopic genre and saw these like sort of 3 hour dull films that you kind of always like oh i'm really got to sit through that well, movie well we know what's coming yeah so we thought like what if we what if we ended the biopic genre in a different way sort of do the anti grape man stories and tell tell movies about these sort of like uh outsiders fighting against the system. Right. And, and all of a sudden, it, bam, you know, we we, it, we had a niche and we were very happy about it. And, and also, we managed to maintain more control than is usual. Correct. You know, in, in Hollywood, the writers are always replaceable. And the biopics, we've never been replaced. Right. Because how would you replace us? Yeah, right, right. right. We act as a who, who else would see yeah. the world who, who, in this? Who, 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 who else would even know anything? Right. Because it takes us six months of research before we can even start writing. Right. So you can't really parachute right. into one of these scripts, and also because we uh, we know all the all the truth and the facts, uh, we wound up being a part of the production much more. Like the production designer or the costume designer would meet with us, would be like, "What is what did Bella Lugosi's house look like?" Or yeah. what kind of outfits did Margaret Keene wear? That, there were that kind of things where all of a sudden we were a part of the production in a way that we weren't. Uh, on the family, right? Comedies. You you knew so much that really right. only you could answer. Yeah, correct, correct. Right? And they wanted us around. Right. And then Man on the Moon is sort of the next one again. Yes, Andy Kaufman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I knew George Shapiro a little uh, bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. New York, yeah. great guy. George yeah. great guy. Andy Kaufman, he's fantastic. Yeah. Agent uh, who yeah. I think played a role in helping to get this movie made. Did George help? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, when 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 Danny and Milos decided they want to make a movie about uh, Andy, they went to George and sort of got the blessings of George and through George the family. And then once you had that. Basically, George could make every single person magically appear in our office. Right. So, you know, Andy's brother, Andy's sister, Andy's father, Andy's girlfriend one, Andy's girlfriend two, Andy's girlfriend three, <laughs> every girlfriend, everybody from the cast of Taxi. It's just, you you name it, they would just all magically appear and tell us Andy's stories. Also, uh, George had saved up every single piece of tape from everything Andy had oh, ever man. done. I mean, he, he had tapes from 3 a.m. at the improv when there was just two people in the audience and as Andy just on a Sunday night just being experimental uh, George also had I'm just remembering this um, he the had cassette. these weird cassette tapes <laughs> and they were tapes of Andy 
talking about like weird career plans taped in within George's office. It, right. It's like it's like Nixon tapes. It's right. sort of like exactly. they're very much like Nixon <laughs> yeah. tapes. And it's just George and Andy sort of talking about Andy's frustrations with the world and what Andy wants to do next. And they were really interesting to us because you're sort of hearing Andy off camera, yeah. mm-hmm. off stage, just talking as Andy. But what's weird about those tapes, though, is it actually it, it, it fed into our paranoia that Andy was really alive. Because we, we started thinking <laughs> right? yeah, because I, I, at I, a I've certain always point. Wondered yeah. at this because point. these tapes seem too convenient. Like, oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, from 20 years ago, I had these private conversations. Uh, you know. yeah, so we, right. we started thinking that we were being played by George and that George <laughs> well, and Andy were in collusion. The, the premiere of the correct, film. Correct, yeah. correct, correct. Yeah. Right. Which would have been the ultimate long yeah. play. I, 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 we, I we mean, the, the big the big regret was there was a point in time where the premiere of the movie was going to be timed to what would it have been I'm going to say I could be getting the dates wrong Andy's 50th birthday right the day of and Bob Zamuda who who's the character played by Paul Giamatti in the movie who's the schemer who's mm-hmm. Andy's writing partner we had this whole thing worked out where there was a guy <laughs> there was going to be a guy with bandages on his sure, face the, the who, invisible man who, uh, who was going to like show up with like a couple like people like, helping him walk like, right. and he was going to like come in discreetly yeah like 30 seconds before right before the, the yeah. lights go down and freak out the audience and that was our big evil plan but then unfortunately uh Tony Clifton started doing some promotional appearances at the press junket Tony Clifton and Tony upset a lot of people and a lot of the a lot of apple carts got turned over right before the movie opened, and <laughs> yeah, so Universal so was, pulled back on yeah. any any guerrilla marketing. Yeah, saying, no, that, yeah. Stop the meta. We just actually need to sell the movie. Stop stop the <laughs> you meta know what? promotion. It's a Jim Carrey Christmas comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up about everything else. You know, I, so so we work back to Big Eyes because I yes, think it's interesting sorry. that you've kind of followed. Oh, that's this why path we're here, right? That's right. Where where you've got uh, Ed Wood as a as a let's call him a misunderstood mm-hmm. artist. Well, uh, you know something that's really funny. I'm I, I'm, I'm assuming this is where you're going, but there's really a big connection between Ed Wood and, and Margaret Keene where Ed Wood was considered the you know the worst filmmaker of all time and and Margaret Keene's art has always really been a polarizing I, that, thing. that's what I was going to say yeah. I mean her art like is, people there's is always there's still very under, debate misunderstood where just like you know some people really really hate it some people really love it uh, and um, I, I say more so it's that the critics hated it sure and the people loved it. Sure, right. Sure, sure. We, we, so it was very populist. It yeah. was kind of like problem child. Yeah, and then, exactly. and, 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 exactly. no, and then we got to have fun with that. Uh, the high art, low art debates within the movie. Right, right. Which is, well, <clears throat> why are the critics valid? Should they be valid if everybody else loves it? Who cares what the New York Times says if millions of people are buying it and hanging it up in their houses and they're enjoying it? Right. And well, that was, you know what? That was Walter Keene's genius. Was the fact that he. He found a way to get around these gatekeepers because the gatekeepers yeah, yeah, were yeah. really important during this time. The, the the art critics, the galleries, and so Walter was the first guy to say, "I don't need these people. I'll yeah. open my own gallery. I'll put up my own. I don't block. need respect. You know? Right. Oh, oh, oh an, art, an art critic who reads an art critic. You know, uh, Joan Crawford's coming to town. I'm going to give her a free painting and have my buddy take a picture of it, and that's going to run in every newspaper. Right. People are like, oh, I want to have a I want to have a painting that Joan Crawford owns. Exactly. And so he he hey, he, hey I'll get Natalie Wood to go on the Tonight Show and say I'm a genius. Well, yeah. in a weird way, it, it kind of is. You know, he was. Almost like a reality star. I totally. mean, he was like the. Totally. I mean, yeah, was like that's this weird funny. Sort of Kim Kardashian. Absolutely. I'm going to show up that's and I'm going to alert the paparazzi yeah. exactly where I'm going to be. Yeah. yeah. No. I mean. I mean. He. He was. He was letting. He was letting the tail wag the dog in terms of it, the media comes first, but the media doesn't realize they're all being gamed by him. And he was just. I mean. I mean. We. We've got just so much stuff, and we. We. You know. We have a lot of articles that came out, sort of about important things the Kings are doing, and then we would basically find. The press release that Walter had typed up, <laughs> right? You know, uh, announcing all oh, this big scholarship to the the Tokyo University Art Fund. It's like, <laughs> you know, and he's donating five hundred yen. It's like, maybe that was twelve dollars. I don't, <laughs> I don't even know. But but then we get treated like news, yeah. And then it would move more product, yeah. And you know, and Walter was he was sort of moving product copies of art, not the not the originals. This is before Andy Warhol, before Peter Max, before yeah. Thomas Kincaid. I mean, Walter was the first guy to sort of recognize you could do this. Right. And it's really interesting. I spent the weekend at Art Basel in Miami, which is the big art, high art fair right now. And um, uh, I was very kind of nervous to show the film there. And, and uh, you know, but it, uh, walking around there, I instantly knew I had no reason to be nervous because the line between <laughs> high art and low art has just been destroyed. And, and, and it was uh, it was very, very cool. There's a lot of beautiful, beautiful art there. But, you know, it is a... a, a the art world is as much about commerce as it is about art now, and I think Walter Keene's one of the first guys to really, really 
see the future. So you uh, you ultimately complete the film, and uh, Tim Burton comes yeah. on as direct. And and I guess you and Tim Burton obviously work together on on Ed Wood. Yeah. In, in your mind, what made him the right guy for for this film, this script? I mean, uh, this is something I've really come to recently in thinking about. It, is that is that Tim Tim is a visual artist. He's a he's a person who um, who uh, you know doesn't really it's not a verbal person he 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 thinks in images and, and that's why the movies look the way they do and i think that what's interesting is margaret Keane is this quiet character who expresses herself onto the canvas which is very similar to the way the way tim he really expresses himself in his films and in his art and i think that he could have that simpatico relationship uh with with and that's why there's so much that's so touching uh in those scenes of margaret just being quiet and painting you know i Obviously, the, he's got the sequences, kind of the surreal sequences, where the characters yeah. have very mm -hmm. big eyes. She yeah. has that scene in the grocery mm -hmm. store. Yeah. But am I wrong to think that much of the casting that that they were looking for, Tim was looking for, you were looking for characters with naturally open faces and natural... Because I noticed that throughout. For example, her yeah. daughter, I think... Well, well, no, well, the daughter had to be cast that way because if you sort of take it back to the beginning, Margaret... Was, Margaret started painting Big Eyed Children because she was painting her daughter. I mean, in, in the sense that she was always kind of a trapped person. Margaret was a young mother. She's home alone with her you know, little three-year-old daughter. So what's she going to paint? She's going to paint Jane. So we wanted a Jane with big eyes. Right, right. And so that's there your you inspiration. Go. But even but her... I think but I think it's, it's it really comes down to a Burton thing. To be quite honest, yeah. well, you go back to Corpse Bride, you go back to any of the animated oh, uh, sure. films, and and Tim is very influenced by Margaret's yeah. art. Yeah, so, and so, Winona and Winona, yeah, Winona Ryder and Beetlejuice and, and yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, Tim Tim is uh, you know likes that big eyed kind of look, and and someone like say Christian Ritter. Who, I was going to say Christian, yeah, Christian Ritter, Ritter walked in uh, for, to audition for the movie, and I think it was like the second she walked in, you knew she was she getting the part because she, she looks like she looks like a keen and oh, she looks I, like a I, I was lobbying yeah. for her for so early on yeah. because for me, in terms of like selling fifties beatnik chick, yeah. yeah, bam, boy, she's really she got walks that on look. screen, you've got it, yeah, yeah. She's you got, got that, that Betty look. Page vibe going, huh. yeah. So uh, you you ultimately finish the film and you show it to Margaret Keane who's yeah, still alive. Really nice. Yes. Yeah. Um, what did she think? Of that the was film? really that was really one of the nicest days of our career. I think we we uh, we because when we first got the rights from Margaret, she was in her late seventies. Now she's in her late eighties, and so we we went on this very long journey with her, and she always trusted us. But you know the movie was wasn't getting made, and she, oh, are you guys making my movie? Well, we yet? kept telling her we yeah. were making it, and then it kept falling apart. Right. So we would like raise her hopes and then crush them yeah. raise them and crush them so over that, and over you know Tim uh, Tim's a perfectionist and he didn't want to show her the movie until it was completely done but we really wanted her to see it so he he, he finally relented and we went to San Francisco over the summer and showed her a very early rough cut of the movie and um, uh, it was just her and Jane her daughter and Jane's husband in this gigantic theater and uh, you know they wanted us to sit down next to her but we're like no 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 we just want you to experience and so what we really want to do is sit a couple rows behind her so we could watch her watch the movie and uh, it was great. So the movie starts, and one of the very early scenes is um, uh, a scene of Margaret in the, in the park with her daughter, like painting. And you could see them like poke each other in, in recognition of what was on screen. And so we knew we knew we were in good shape. But afterwards, we walked over, and she was just weeping, and she well, she was so touched by the movie, and she so loved full, it so much. Full seal of approval. Yeah. And no, no. Well, yeah. that didn't exactly happen. No, no, no. That she what really what really surprised us was how much she said like uh, like Walter. She was like, it was like being back with Walter for two hours. Wow. You know, it was really amazing. Um, I mean, uh, tomorrow night we're having a screening, which is going to be the only time Margaret's going to come see it with an audience. Right. And is that, wow. You know, that, 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 that's going to be really crazy how old, for, for how her. How old is she now? She's 87. 87, no. So, so she's flying down for this this one screening, and it's going to be with 800 people. And yeah. We'll see, you know, wow. what, it's, yeah. what that's like for her. Is she going to be able to, is she at a, at a point in her life where she can still speak? And yeah, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. She's going to be part I mean, of I mean, part I mean, of the, I mean, her, her and Amy Adams are going to do a little Q&A. Yeah, oh, I mean, wow, that's that's she's, wonderful. Wonderful. she's yeah. moving slower, but. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and she still paints. Yeah. 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 Wow, amazing. Uh, so when, I'm curious from you guys, when you look at one of these paintings, um, it's easy to sort of write it off to kitsch. I guess it's. I guess because I saw it at my grandmother's house, right. that completely colors the experience. Also, also, when you were at your grandmother's house, uh, it was probably anonymous art to you. Yes, it was. It had just that block letter, Keen signature. Yep. You didn't know who or what Keen was. 
you, I mean, if you were a kid, you probably were unaware of Walter. But oh, if, yeah. if you had known that the painting was being painted by a really sad woman yep. who's locked in the back of her house and has no friends and is painting that crying child, that might have made you feel uh, absolutely it something right. really strong. Yeah. yeah, I think I think once you know the story and where those paintings are coming from and that they're coming from a sincere place – they take on a different a different meaning. I mean, I'll, I'll compare once again to Ed Wood. When Ed in in one of Ed Wood's first movies is a movie called Glenn or Glenda, where, yes. where Ed comes out as a transvestite in that film, and he and plays all, himself. Yeah, and yeah. all through the when we were growing up in the seventies, eighties, that movie was played at played at revival houses, and people were hooting and hollering, and, and they just made fun of that movie. But once you knew that that was actually Ed in the film, and that Ed was was telling his own personal story in that movie, uh, and all of a sudden it looked like it looked like personal filmmaking, personal experimental filmmaking. Yeah. It's much harder to laugh at Glenn or Glenda now than it was a long time ago. And I think the same thing with Margaret's art. Once you realize what she was putting into it, it has a much more power than than, than it did when it was just, oh, I, I bought it at Woolworths. Yeah, yeah. No, it is, it is different. It's weird. I've moved, when my grandmother passed away last year, I moved a lot of her furniture out here to California because mm-hmm. uh, it was sentimental to mm-hmm. me. Right. And I, my house is kind of mid-century, and her oh, furniture good. is really from wow. the Fantastic. middle yeah. of the century. Wow. And now I regret not having that uh, keying. Oh, no. That's funny. Uh, well, it's funny. Well, the Ma- they were Matthew- probably cheap knockoffs. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Matthew Sweet, because people now know that he's, uh, he's a collector, he gets a lot of people like you who contact him. Like, uh, my, my grandfather died, and we yeah. went to the basement, and these paintings that we really don't like are down there. But we're here. You'll buy them from us. Right. You know, we right. please come and take them away? That's, yeah, because, uh, I mean, yeah. with the originals, Margaret doesn't even know how many she produced. Yeah. Really? Because, I mean, it's like Walter was pointing a gun at her, just like, paint, paint, paint. Yeah. Right. So it was just a one-woman factory, and, and so much of it just got dispersed 50 years ago. Yeah. So well, they I, just keep reappearing. And, and, and yeah, and I, I mean, I think that this, this film kind of yeah. legitimizes them in a weird way, at least as a part of a generation, as a part of our history. I mean, right. I mean it, and, it'd be cool if, if at least the paintings are, are reapproached and – Considered in terms of their influence on pop art, modern art. Well, I think, I think they have, they've had a big influence because uh, almost what what you said about your your grandmother and Tim says about his grandmother. I mean, the art that people saw as a as as a child. If you grew up to be an artist, they had some kind of effect on you. And there's a whole new slew of uh, of artists, someone like Mark Ryden or someone like Nara from Japan, who really looked at. Is trying are trying to reinvent the big eyed kind of look for a modern day audience, and so uh, you know it, it's interesting to now look at Margaret as a as an influence to some of the modern art of today. Uh, well, it is a it's a terrific film. Thank I you. Really, Thank you. really enjoyed it. Great Amy Adams performance. Christoph Waltz, you can't really go wrong with him. Tim Burton, <laughs> it's just, Danny Houston yeah. is fantastic in it, and of course, it's all built upon uh, your script, which is uh, fascinating. As your scripts tend to be, other than Problem Child. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Larry Scott, thank you. Thank very, you, very thank much. you. This and, is fun, and thanks everybody for watching the Venice Mace podcast. <laughs>